name is Ben Green, and I'm excited to be able to talk to you about my paper, The False Promise of Risk Assessments, Epistemic Reform, and the Limits of Fairness. So as many in this community knows, risk assessments have been widely adopted across the US criminal justice system in a variety of contexts and have risen in use in recent years. And what's particularly interesting about this uh, sort of is the political consensus that's formed around risk assessments from Democrats and Republicans, from prosecutors to criminal defense organizations in support of these tools as an effective path forward for the criminal justice system. The theory of change behind the value of risk assessments involves two key components. The first is objectivity, that risk assessments will mitigate judicial biases by providing objective decisions about defendants. And second, uh, criminal justice reform, that these objective risk assessments will replace discriminatory policies and reduce incarceration. So I spend the first two thirds of the paper sort of interrogating these claims and talking about why this theory of change actually falls short of being realistic in practice. Uh, rather than replacing discretion with objectivity, risk assessments shift discretion to other people and other decisions. Rather than promoting structural reform, risk assessments reinforce and legitimize carceral logics and policies. There's much more detail on these arguments in the paper, which draw on STS, critical legal studies, and insights from prison abolitionist thinking. So the, oh, interesting. Uh, so the question where that this leads us to is, so what do we actually do instead? So how can we challenge these systems in a way that is productive, that gets out of the limitations of these systems. And I argue that we need to call for a type of epistemic reform, recognizing that in many ways the, the desire for risk assessments is not just about technical capabilities, but is actually about a sort of view of society where everything can be dissolved to a set of mechanistic prediction processes. And as long as we have that view of the world, any critiques of these systems are gonna be met with uh, calls for essentially better technical systems. And so I think we should shift from challenging only the technical specifications of these systems to really focusing on the discourses and sort of social theories that are actually making them appear desirable in the first place. So as one example of this in the paper, I go through an argument around the impossibility of fairness. Uh, this is obviously a canonical result in this space which states that if two groups have different rates of an outcome, then it is impossible for predictions about those groups to both be calibrated and have balanced errors. And in the context of criminal justice risk assessments, this often leads to a sense of sort of resignation, that it's impossible to have fairness, and so you know, we have to make some set of trade-offs and we'll accept what we can do, and that's really the best that, that there is, because fairness is impossible. But I think we can sort of unpack this claim and unpack this result a little bit. And the key is to think about how these notions of fairness actually connect to different notions of equality. Uh, I view calibration as akin to what's known as formal equality, uh, we've heard throughout this morning, the idea that similar people should be treated similarly, and error rate balance as akin to notions of substantive equality, that groups should obtain similar outcomes even if that requires accounting for different social conditions across groups. And this distinction is particularly important because uh, we need to sort of unpack what's often conflated but two different sources of algorithmic bias. On the one hand, we have uh, what I refer to as human bias, which is often the primary focus in fat star literature, uh, you know, when data sets reflect the decisions of biased humans. But on the other hand, there's also uh, what I call population inequity, that the data that we have uh, reflects empirical results that are differentiated across the population, uh, which typically is, is related to historical forms of oppression and inequality, and this distinction connects to the notion that was brought up in yesterday's keynote, distinguishing between discrimination uh, and, and oppression, and so, or exploitation. So bringing all of this together, I think we can reinterpret the impossibility result as what I call an incompatibility of equality, where the impossibility of fairness provides a mathematical proof of how in an already unequal society, decisions based in formal equality are actually guaranteed to produce substantive inequality. 
And this argument has a couple of particularly key insights regarding the limits of fairness as it's typically conceived within these uh, projects of algorithmic decision making. The first is that algorithmic fairness tends to sideline social context, narrowing the scope of judgments about justice, often leaving behind the aspects of population inequity, the existing inequalities that we have in society, and focusing on making formally fair decisions within the immediate bounds of a specific decision. And in doing so, algorithmic fairness tends to overlook trajectories of social change such that a fair algorithm can reinforce discrimination. Uh, in the paper, I go through an argument showing why even if we were to have a perfect risk assessment, one that could predict binary outcomes with 100% accuracy, it would still end up falling into this trap of the incompatibility of equality, reinforcing notions of formal equality in an unequal society, and leading to uh, the further exacerbation of the substantive inequality that we already see. So, the, this has significant, I'll go back for a sec, this has significant implications for uh, projects of social reform that relate to the use of algorithms. Oftentimes, algorithms, really the project is to optimize a specific decision, to optimize the allocation of goods and outcomes within a specific decision. But as I've described, often we get into sort of an impossible bind when we do that. There are significant trade-offs within that context, and there's a sense of it's not really clear what we can do. But the reason we are in that challenge is because we're taking, I think, an overly narrow approach to what types of social change are possible. Uh, there's a quote from legal scholar Joseph Fishkin writing about equal opportunity, where he writes, instead of taking the structure of opportunities as essentially given, we should renovate the structure itself in ways large and small to open up a broader range of paths. And this is a, has really important implications for the criminal justice system with regard to risk assessments, but also the broader projects of algorithmic decision making that many in this community are working on across numerous contexts. That oftentimes projects of optimizing a specific decision, although potentially leading to some benefits, are not going to actually get to better outcomes as much as taking a more holistic view of the entire system and finding ways uh, whether algorithmically or not, to actually renovate the structure of that decision to enable better outcomes for everyone. Thank you.